Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, welcome to those of you in the room, uh, and also welcome to uh, those who are watching by webcast. I know we have um, a few hundred people who've signed up to watch us live, so you are just as welcome out there um, as you are here. Or perhaps I shouldn't say just as welcome, because you've made the effort to physically come here. So 85% as welcome uh, on the screen uh, as those who've come here. My name is Richard Reeves. I'm a senior fellow here uh, in Economic Studies. Uh, and I'm co-director of the Centre on Children and Families. And I'm delighted just to kick off this event, um, which is uh, based around the findings of the American Family Survey. It's in its second year. The survey is a joint project of the Deseret News and Brigham Young University. I'm um, privileged to be one of the advisors to the project, uh, and I've had a small role in helping to uh, frame the questions, but no role at all in the analysis itself or the interpretation uh, of the survey. Um, I'm going to invite uh, the introducer to come up to the stage in just a moment. Um, so just so that those of you who are watching online as well as in the room know what's going to happen, I'm going to step down in a moment. Paul Edwards, who's the editor of Deseret News, is going to come up and introduce the main speakers who will present the headline findings of the survey. After that, we'll have a panel discussion, uh, and I'll be inviting uh, Diane whitmore Schwarzenbach and Brad Wilcox to join us for that discussion. Uh, which will involve Q&A and also some questions from the audience both in the room and online. The only thing I'll say in light of last night's debate um, is to ask all those who are participating, whether online in the room, is if we could, uh, if we could avoid describing each other as liars uh, or as nasty, um, because it's not as if anyone here is running to be President of the United States. <laughs> uh, so with that, I'll hand over to Paul, who's going to introduce our main speakers. Paul. Thank you very much, Richard. It's a, a real honor to partner once again with the Brookings Institution. Uh, the Deseret News in Salt Lake City um, is uh, not only a, a timely, trusted source for news and commentary from the Mountain West, but we also, over the past several years, have tried to be a strong voice nationally on a few core issues where we think that we can provide specific context, perspective, analysis around issues that matter to America's families. Several years ago, as we were launching into uh, creating a stronger enterprise content for the Deseret News uh, in our national context, what we call in-depth work at Deseret News, we recognized that the work that we were doing on the family was largely uh, reliant on the quantitative work done by terrific organizations around the country, but it wasn't always what met our questions. And um, so the editor of our enterprise section, uh, Allison Pond, who's right here in the front today, um, Allison, a former survey researcher, at, uh, survey researcher at the Pew Research Center, recommended that we come up with our own survey to help us provide uh, the kind of quantitative work that would help us answer our questions, not the questions of other research organizations. So Allison uh, partnered with Jeremy Pope and with Chris Karpowitz, co-directors of the Center for Elections and Democracy at Brigham Young University, and Professors uh, Pope and Karpowitz were very kind to help us start to put together uh, this survey, which is now in its second year. And the survey has uh, just released today. Um, it's available online, and we'll be able to provide you with that URL here as we finish up. But um, the, uh, in addition to the kinds of findings that we'll be talking about today, there will be several articles that will appear in the Deseret News um, uh, starting today, rolling out throughout the week uh, by Lois Collins, who is a, uh, an award-winning uh, family uh, journalist who uh, has been frequently recognized by the Council on Contemporary Families as one of the leading family journalists in the country. So uh, we're very excited uh, to start to share these results, which will inform our journalism throughout the year on, on these issues. But uh, as we get started here, I also just want to note our thanks to an advisory panel that's helped us to craft this, 
Uh, Carlin Bowman, who's uh, seated here from American Enterprise Institute, has helped us, um, as has uh, Sarah McClanahan at Princeton University. We're glad to have uh, Brad Wilcox with us, who will be talking. Um, there's Brad over there. He also was on the advisory panel, and of course, the inimitable um, Richard Reeves has been an advisor to this. And um, as R Richard noted, uh, the, the advisory panel has not been involved in the interpretation, but they've been a, a great guide as we put this together. So as we get started here, I'd like to invite um, Chris Karpowitz, uh, Associate Professor of Political Science at Brigham Young University, a real um, expert on issues of deliberation, and uh, Jeremy Pope, uh, who has written extensively about issues of polarization and issues about the American founding, uh, to come forward and share the, the uh, top line results from the second uh, annual American Family Survey. And uh, we hope that this will be an authoritative resource for all who see the family as a vitally important institution for the health and well-being of uh, America's children. So, again, thank you for being able to partner with Brookings today. Thanks, Paul. Let's see. Let's bring up our presentation. There we go. All right. <clears throat> My name is Chris Karpowitz, and as Paul indicates, I'm uh, one of the co-directors of the Center for the Study of Elections and Democracy. It's really a privilege to be here today to talk about the American Family Survey. Um, and the survey, if I can get it to our, our slides to advance here. Maybe, maybe not. There we go. Got it. Um, <clears throat> the survey is a national sample of about 3,000 respondents. It's conducted by YouGov, and so this is an online sample that's been matched back to the census's American Community Survey. So it's intended to mirror the, the, the sample is intended to mirror the U.S. population. Our aim here is, with the American Family Survey is to understand um, two things, both the lived experiences of uh, ordinary Americans in their relationship and family lives, and also their attitudes about relationships and families more broadly. So how do they see the health of uh, American marriages or families um, in the United States today? Uh, about half of the sample is married, more older than younger people married, uh, um, a few more conservative than liberals uh, married. Liberals tend to be a little slightly more likely to be in cohabiting relationships, and about a third of the sample um, is in no relationship at all. Uh, uh, almost two-thirds of the sample have at least one child, and the average number of children in the sample is uh, just under two. So those are some just basic facts about the relationship status of people in the sample. And today we want to do sort of two things. One is to talk about um, marriages and families generally and what has changed and what seems to be stable um, across generations especially. And then we're going to turn to issues of policy and politics and talk a little bit about the relationship between families and relationships and, and, and politics. Whoops. Skipped ahead here. Um, so one of the things that we noticed right off the bat is uh, a changing relationship in the United States between marriage and parenting. When we look across the age cohorts in our sample, we find that 91% of uh, respondents over the age of 65 were married when they had their first child, when they first became a parent. And still majorities of those over 30 um, were married when they um, first became a parent. But among those under the age of 30, that number drops to 30%. 
Now, a majority of th those Americans under 30 were, say they were in a committed relationship when they had their first child, but um, not married. And so we see this very important generational difference um, um, uh, emerging. And I don't think we uh, have the data yet. We need more years of the American Family Survey to truly understand the import of that change, but it is a, a, a marked change. Um, and uh, as we're thinking about that change, um, one of the things we were interested in was people's experiences as children. So we asked them to tell us about their parents' relationship status. Um, and we here are contrasting people whose mothers were continually married to the same person throughout their childhood with those whose mothers were not continually married. And we find that that experience as a child is correlated with their experience with relationships as adults. So those whose mothers were continuously married um, are more likely to be married today they are less likely to say that their relationship is in trouble today, and they're significantly less likely to say that they've experienced a severe economic challenge or crisis in the past 12 months. Jeremy's gonna talk a little bit more about that particular measure, um, but we see this, this correlation, at least, between childhood family stability and the, the economic and relationship stability of um, of people as, as adults. <clears throat> we were also, as we were exploring this, interested in thinking about, well, uh, what is the experience of people as adults with their own children and, and with their relationship, their parenting relationships with um, their partners? And so we asked a variety of questions about the extent to which individuals feel supported by their partners in the task of raising children. And one of the things we find is that cohabiting uh, couples, uh, respondents who are part of a cohabiting couple, feel significantly less support from their partners in, um, in their parenting efforts. And so one of the things that I think bears watching as we, as we move from a situation in which most people are having children in marriage to uh, a situation in which many people are having children um, outside of a formal marriage is how that's affecting the, the parenting efforts and the support that partners feel from each other in those parenting efforts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> As I said, one of the, so we're interested in lived experiences, but we're also interested in attitudes about marriage and family. And we find um, that uh, in general, uh, many people are quite supportive of the idea of marriage. So uh, few Americans, either liberal or conservative, think that marriage is more of a burden than a benefit. Both liberals and conservatives, majorities of both, although more conservatives than liberals, think that marriage makes families and kids uh, better off financially. Um, uh, n nothing close to a majority of either liberals or conservatives think that uh, marriage is old fashioned and out of date. But we do see differences in the extent to which people feel that legal marriage is more important than um, a, a sense of personal commitment to one's partner. Um, and so when we look at that, those are, there are some ideological differences, but there are also some age cohort differences where um, younger Americans and more liberal Americans, but even a majority of younger conservatives believe that personal commitment to one's partner is more important than the legal fact of whether or not one is married to one's partner. And so I think that generational difference also uh, bears watching. When we ask people to think about their own marriages, we find that people feel pretty positively, both in 2015 and in 2016. People generally say their marriages are either getting stronger or are about the same as they were um, previously in the, in the past year or two years. Very few people say their marriages or relationships are getting weaker. Um, but when we ask people to think about marriage as uh, the institution of marriage or the health of marriage in the United States, um, people have 
a great deal of concern. And interestingly enough, conservatives are much more concerned than liberals um, about this, although everyone expresses some concern. The most optimistic group about the future and health of, of marriage are young, more liberal um, Americans, which is interesting. Then um, finally, we are interested in how people actually live their lives. So we do see these differences between liberals and conservatives in attitudes about marriage, a different sense of the social meaning of marriage and the social importance of marriage, um, in some respects at least, between liberals and conservatives. But when we ask them about their family, the specifics of their family lives, how often they eat dinner together, how often they do chores together, we find very few differences between liberals and conservatives. So though liberals and conservatives differ in their attitudes about the social meaning of marriage, their, their lived experience with marriage and relationships and family life is very similar. The one way in which they're different is their worship practices, where conservatives are much more likely to make worship a, a, a regular part of their family life. When we, talk, when we ask them about their parenting practices and the rules um, that they uh, set for their children, we find almost no differences. So liberals and conservatives Younger Americans and older Americans seem to be parenting and living family life in similar ways, even as they see the meaning of marriage and family in social terms in somewhat different ways. And uh, with that, I'll turn to Jeremy to talk about public policy. I want to talk about challenges that families face and then how they want to deal with those challenges on a public policy level. This is a slide that lists what people said were the most important issues facing marriages and families. And we divided them. I should say they didn't see this in the survey. We didn't tell them, well, this is an economics issue. This is a culture issue. We divided them into issues of economics, culture, and family structure and stability. And by and large, things don't change between 2015 and 2016. But you will notice there is one interesting difference that economics has gotten more salient for people a bit, at least with respect to marriages and families. Culture maybe has attenuated a little bit, but the thing that face, the, the, the issue that faces most families that they you know, say uh, will be important tends to be economics. With, of course, one exception that I want to point out now for Richard, which is the thing that comes up the most is parents not teaching or disciplining their children sufficiently. I don't think very many of these people were running for president, but they are willing to criticize one another in their parenting <laughs> practices. Uh, they may have violated your rule, but they didn't know about your rule, so let's excuse them. One of the things that we wanted to measure on this survey was whether or not people had experienced a particular kind of economic crisis. And so we picked a set of things that we thought would capture some of that. And we asked them, did you, did you experience this crisis in the last year? Things like not paying the full amount of a bill or needing financial aid from friends, not going to the doctor, and so on and so forth. You can, you can read the full list there. As you can see, most people don't experience each of these crises. And if you just looked at the right-hand column there, where most people seem to say, no, they haven't had most of these things happen to them. But let me point out, the people who say none of the above, in other words, the people who haven't experienced any of these, it's only 62%. That means about 4 in 10 Americans have had one of these things occur to them. That's a substantial number. And, one of, and, and the consistent finding throughout this survey is that having an economic crisis is related to a lot of interesting things. Having that experience matters a great deal. It is connected to um, family structure. As you can see in this slide, people that are cohabiting or in a relationship are more likely to have experienced an economic crisis as opposed to people who are married or single. They tend not to have experienced this. And we did just want to point out along the way, um, uh, single mothers tend to have experienced these crises more, but this, this uh, particular table on, on your, your right there breaks it down just by income. So mothers that were making less than $30,000 a year, uh, the percentage of those that were single mothers was you know 63% as opposed to only 29 and 10 in those higher categories. So there is family structure, family structure is related to economic distress. Now, we, Chris also mentioned we want to talk a bit about public policy. One of the things we did, we asked people, how much support do you have for these programs and how you think that they help families? The three programs there, and 
maybe it's in a pretty small font, but maybe we should have made it bigger. Food stamps, housing assistance, and Medicaid and insurance. Now I've divided it so that the red bars are for people who have experienced an economic crisis and the soothing sea green bars are for people who have not experienced uh, an economic crisis. But the darker bar in each shade are people who have benefited from the program. And again, it highlights the importance of an experience. People who have actually benefited from food stamps or have benefited from housing assistance, they rate these programs significantly higher. I will point out that everyone tends to think these programs benefit families. It's not that, well not everyone, but on average people do. It's not the case that people are negative about these programs, but you need to have had the experience of benefiting from these programs. Um, two more programs that we looked at that are uh, slightly different are the earned income tax credit and minimum wage. And here we found substantially more support for minimum wage or sorry, for the earned income tax credit than for minimum wage. Although that's something we want to look at in future data. We want to see, well, are people dissatisfied with the minimum wage because it's too low or too high? That's something that you know, we're going to have to focus on in future research. Again, though, having benefited from the program is very, very important for structuring people's attitudes. Um, it also, one of the other variables we looked at was how reliant upon yourself you are. And it turns out that people in the lowest income category are the people who tend to rely mostly on themselves. They don't tend to reach out to churches. They don't tend to reach out to community organizations or have as much help from their neighbors or their community. Instead, they're slightly more likely, well, somewhat more likely, to rely only on themselves. Um, we also, and there's a lot in the report that we aren't able to cover today because we're trying to go quickly. We look very carefully at family leave. And family leave tends to be quite popular, although there's a bit less certainty about how it should be paid for. You can see in this graph, though, that that is broken out by ideology. So if you're liberal in the blue bars, you, want, you definitely want family leave and you want it to be uh, paid for um, uh, by the government or by the corporation that you work for, whereas, um, Fewer people who are conservative feel that strongly about that. And there's a fairly substantial amount of conservatives who don't think family leave is terribly important. But it tends to be a pretty popular uh, program for helping people out. We're political scientists, so we want to hit the election just a little bit. There are some, some interesting differences in some places where there aren't differences between Clinton and Trump voters. I should say this survey was done a number of months ago, so this is not a flash poll from last night's debate. Uh, but it does give you a sense of how there are some differences in the basis of support. Unsurprisingly, Hillary Clinton does better in this poll. She does better with essentially most of the different family structure groups. You can see she does better with those who are living with a partner or in a relationship. Trump essentially ties her um, with people that are married or people who have children. And this is something we've seen consistently in our research, that these two characteristics tend to be associated with conservatism. I couldn't say that they're causal, but there's, it's important to understand that being married and having kids changes the way that you approach these things. Now, one of the other variables we looked at was how authoritarian you are, and there's been a lot of political science interest in this. It's a battery of questions, which you can read about in the survey, which talk about how your parenting practices, how, how authoritarian you want to be as a parent. And it turns out that there is a pretty big difference there. The least authoritarian people definitely prefer Hillary Clinton, and the more authoritarian people strongly prefer Donald Trump. There is also a point about economic crisis again. People who have experienced an economic crisis definitely tend to prefer Hillary Clinton. Um, and as Chris already mentioned, I'm going to skip that no social connections point. People who are worried about marriages generally tend to support Donald Trump. Um, let me show you one more political graph. This is the percentage of Trump voters minus the percentage of Clinton voters. And so having a higher score on this graph means that you tended to prefer Trump. And it's broken out by gender and by whether you experienced a crisis or no crisis. As you can see, there's a fairly strong impact of being a male who has experienced no crisis. This is the group who likes Donald Trump. And the group who is less enamored with Donald Trump and his set of policies are men who have experienced an economic crisis and essentially all women who were not terribly influenced by that particular variable. Now, let me just say a word to conclude about some big picture lessons. Chris and I come from a discipline, political science, that in our judgment doesn't quite take family seriously enough for politics and policy in some respects. And so that's part of why we're interested in doing this. One of the things that we've learned, and maybe it should have been obvious to, to us beforehand, is the importance of experience. What you experience in life matters a great deal. 
In our own discipline, we are obsessed these days with causal effects and experiments and A-B tests and what you can do to prove that some sort of policy or program has an effect. I don't want to sound negative about those things. I think it's very good and it's useful that political scientists care about this. But I will say that there are a lot of context variables that we can't manipulate. We can't go and change whether or not you live with your mother uh, or your mother lived with her partner continuously or how many kids you have. Though I know political scientists who would love to assign that as a treatment to people just to find out uh, what would happen. Uh, um, probably other people, that's right. Um, even though we can't do that, that doesn't mean that these variables aren't of paramount importance. And so one of the hopes that we have with this particular study, and one of the things we're going to try to accomplish going forward, is to get people to take these context variables even more seriously than they do, because we think it has a great deal of impact on people's lives, politically, socially, in their families, and in a number of ways. Thanks very much for listening to us today. We appreciate it, and we look forward to hearing the comments. Thank you, uh, thank you, Paul, for the introduction, and to uh, Jeremy and Chris for doing that so quickly and crisply. That was, you know, genuinely a masterclass in how to get a lot of information across uh, quickly to an audience. So we're now going to move to uh, our respondents, and then to the moderated discussion, then to kind of Q and A. So I'm going to invite uh, Brad Wilcox. Brad is uh, an advisor to the um, project, uh, as Paul said, um, but he's also director of the National Marriage Project and a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. So um, Brad has decided that he, he's not going to be out PowerPointed by the guys from BYU. So he's, he, uh, he's just uh, given us some slides. Um, so rather than inviting the whole panel up, I'm going to let Brad come up, do his presentation. Then, Diane, if you want to come up and do yours. And as you didn't do slides, you get extra time as a kind of bonus, as a no PowerPoint bonus time. But anyway, <laughs> Brad Wilcox will... <laughs> Lots of them. This. Great. Okay. Good. Thanks, uh, Richard, for having us here today and to the Deseret News and BYU for uh, an excellent survey. Now, this actually session today is entitled uh, Like Father, Like Son, um, but I had a chance to look at the, uh, the data in, in the survey and kind of break it out by gender. And as you'll see in a few minutes, I think there's a very interesting story here for moms and for daughters as well um, in today's uh, survey. But I want to begin by um, just pointing out that there's been an increasing focus um, in research, primarily by economists, on the way in which family instability is affecting boys. Uh, one example of this is a recent report by David Autor um, and Melanie Wasserman called Wayward Sons, um, looking at uh, the impact of family instability, particularly on, on boys and young men. And when it comes to incarceration, schooling, and employment, we're seeing as it looks like boys are, are affected more um, by family instability or by the retreat from marriage um, than our girls. So these are obviously pretty important outcomes uh, today. So just to kind of give you an example of this kind of research, we're seeing, for instance, in David Autor's work um, in Florida is that there is um, a, a gender gap between boys and girls in Florida schools. And what's interesting is that this gender gap is bigger um, on things like school absences, uh, school suspensions, and high school dropout rates um, for boys from uh, father absent homes, here in the middle of the, the blue figure, um, compared to boys from married parent homes. So again, it's just in some important way, uh, boys are affected, at least when it comes to school, more by family instability, more by the absence of marriage, um, than our girls, and he's looking at this issue with his, with his colleagues uh, by comparing siblings. So it's a, it's a nice, I think, design. And then we kind of extend our gaze to, um, to employment, we see is that um, young men 
from uh, single parent homes um, are doing worse um, in terms of employment than young men from married parent homes. This is from new work by Raj Chetty um, and colleagues uh, this year. And if you kind of just compare um, the, the blue triangles uh, for young men um, on the right and the left, you, what you can see obviously is that um, these guys from single parent homes are less likely to be employed um, than their peers from married parent homes. And this, and this pattern extends across um, the sort of income spectrum uh, in terms of where they were coming from. So again, suggest that when it comes to education and employment, um, boys and young men are affected more by family stability and retreat from marriage. And in speculating about what's happening here, Otter has kind of pointed to two different theories. Um, one is that boys may be especially vulnerable to externalizing. Or they don't have um, a stable two-parent household with the time, attention, and income that brings. And then also, too, that there may be kind of a male role model effect where boys are growing up without a same-sex parent um, who, you know, isn't providing them with kind of modeling uh, connection to family, connection to labor market, maybe more likely than the flounder in school um, and later on in labor force, because they don't have that kind of male role model um, present to them. So this brings us to today's survey um, from BYU and the Deseret News. And what's interesting here is that the story kind of flips. So when you kind of look at these outcomes that were talked about um, a little bit earlier today um, in terms of you know, is your current relationship in trouble? What we see is that uh, women in the survey um, are more likely to report that outcome uh, when they're coming from an unstable um, family um, compared uh, to men. So it might be, if this survey is, is representative of um, the pattern more generally, that on kind of the relationship front, family instability affects women more than men. So, of course, I want to see this this pattern replicated in different data sets, but certainly, I think, interesting. And then even on the economic crisis um, outcome measured in this survey, we also see, again, that women who are coming from unstable families are more likely to report that they're currently in um, some kind of economic crisis uh, compared to men. Um, and this is also, I think, potentially um, an issue we, we can look at uh, with different data sets to see if it's, if it's replicated. Now, why would it be that on these two outcomes we're more likely to see uh, women being affected than men. Well, I think um, two possibilities um, are as follows. The first is that women may benefit from having a kind of female role model um, in navigating relationships. And if they've had a stable marriage um, in their background, um, that might, you know, help them pick a better mate. By contrast, without that role model, they might be more likely to pick a less than ideal mate and to experience... Um, both family instability and other problems in their relationships. It's also, of course, the case that young women from non intact families may be more likely to end up as single mothers and to incur both a, a sort of a bigger motherhood penalty as a consequence of this, and especially uh, less financial support um, from, you know, obviously from a spouse or uh, from a partner. So to conclude, I think that there are two takeaways um, from uh, today's survey and from our discussion. Um, so the first is that I think the survey's results reinforce the idea that policy and research on economic mobility, income inequality, and poverty need to factor in family structure. Studies and reports on these topics that don't do this should be discounted. Uh, the second thing is that I, I think, you know, although the idea that marriage matters when it comes to the social and economic welfare of men, women, and children is still a matter of intellectual debate among elites today. It's not a matter of debate for them in practice, okay? Overwhelmingly, as this figure from Robert Putnam's recent book suggests, our elites get and stay married and make sure that their kids enjoy the benefits of stable marriage. And they generally live and move in neighborhoods, schools, soccer leagues, and social networks that are dominated by married families. And there, I think there's a reason for that. At some practical level, I think many elites understand that they and their kids more likely to flourish socially and economically if they manage to get and stay married. So I think one of the challenges facing all of us who are concerned about mobility, inequality, and poverty is figuring out how to extend this marriage-minded ethos um, to, uh, to our fellow citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um,
we're going to have plenty to discuss, I think. Um, so our next respondent is uh, Diane Shansenbach. How was that? Pretty good. Um, it's a game, so I can actually pronounce Diane's name correctly. So I'm pleased I managed it for once. Um, uh, so Diane, you get to give your response, and then once you've done that, um, we'll move to some Q&A, as I said before. Diane uh, is the director of the Hamilton Project uh, here at Brookings, um, working uh, in her own case, particularly on issues around uh, economic inequality, but with a strong interest in family policy, and is also a professor at Northwestern. Um, when she's not at Brookings, she is up there. So Diane, over to you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, this was, I recommend this uh, survey and the results to you all uh, very strongly. There's so much in here that we're only going to be able to scratch uh, you know, the smallest amount of the surface. And I think the big headline takeaway really is that Americans like marriage. They love marriage. Uh, you know, we think that it's in trouble, but um, even people who aren't married support marriage. Um, I'd like to say I'm such a fan of marriage that I voluntarily took on the last name Schanzenbach in celebration of it. So, <clears throat> greater, greater so I share you. that. Exactly. That's exactly right. But of course, I guess one thing that I think really stands out in this, this survey um, today is um, just the importance of the economy um, in the background here. And I think that um, the professors uh, mentioned it, and uh, all the professors mentioned it actually, and it's correct, that uh, we should be talking much more about how economics and the dramatic changes in economics that we're seeing right now is affecting the family. Um, so in, something that was um, not as surprising to me because um, because I'm deeper into this, um, th this research, but nearly 40% of people reported experiencing an economic crisis in the last year, not being able to pay a bill, um, trouble paying for food, not willing, not able to go to the doctor because they can't afford it. And that is, that is a reality. It is not a reality just among people in poverty anymore, but it's creeping up and up the income distribution in a way that I'm not sure that we know what to do with. And so we need to be talking and thinking quite a bit about what is this going to mean for, uh, for the American family. An important thing that's running around in the background and if I would have known about slides, I would have brought, I brought a slide that showed this. But um, men are dropping out of the labor force in a way that we have not, we, we've not ever seen before. Uh, you know, as recently as 50 years ago, 98% of prime age men were in the labor force. Uh, much of our society is built on men, prime age men, working, um, and that has has changed dramatically. Um, today, about 15% of prime age men between age 25 and 54 have dropped out of the labor force and are not working. Um, and Larry Summers projects that up to a quarter of men will not be in the labor force uh, by the year 2050. Um, some of that is, bec uh, you know, due to um, you know shifts in what jobs are available, automation. You know, the machines are coming, and they're going to take a lot of people's jobs with them. Um, but what we need to think about, uh, you know, much more in social science is what is this going to mean mean for families? Um, and I think there are two important strands of research that I wanted to call your attention to around this. Um, the first is a different, uh, different set of papers by David Otter, which looks carefully at local areas that experienced um, economic uh, depressions, um, you know, negative shocks, um, in large part due to um, shifts in, in, um, in where, where jobs are available, in large part because of um, increasing trade with China. And so he's got a nice series of papers that looks at, well, you know, what happens to wages, what happens to, you know, um, permanent employment, things like that. And it's all very devastating. You know, people lose jobs and by and large aren't able to, to find them again. But in his newest work, he's turning to, well, what does this mean for kids? What's happening to children? What's happening to families? And it will not be surprising to anyone on this panel, for sure, that that means that um, children are less likely to um, have two-parent families when jobs go away. Um, it seems to be mostly that uh, people are not getting married in the first place. It doesn't seem to cause a spike in divorces, but what it does cause is uh, for people not to get uh, married in the first place. There's a lot of research that seems to point to that same direction. Uh, I was mentioning this to some other economists, and they were, you know, scratching their heads. They're like, well, why? Why not? It's so much cheaper when you share, you know, share a home with someone. You should get married, you know, even if you don't have have money. But the, but Americans don't, and uh, I think we need to understand that. Um, Another strand of literature that I think is going to be very important going forward as the economy continues to change, because I cannot underscore enough, it is going to change, you know, in the next 20, 
to 30 years, um, is work by Marianne Bertrand and uh, Jessica Pan on um, how families negotiate uh, wives' incomes and husbands' incomes uh, together. So uh, their takeaway, their top, top shelf finding there is that um, men really don't like to be married to women who make more money than, than they do. And um, so that's, that's shift, uh, and, and many, many more women are making more, more money uh, than men. And so that's, just, uh, that's um, explaining part of the reason for the decline in original marriage, uh, you know, or first marriage rates. Um, and this is going to continue to come. And I think um, to the extent that in future years we could understand, you know, how do we think about the relationship between gender roles and, um, and earning potential uh, will be very, very important. Um, maybe the last point that I'll make, although I've got a lot of other points um, to make, I, I guess two things. First is uh, there's gr great agreement that the safety net is important. This is not surprising to me. I think Americans are a generous people. I think we have, um, after welfare reform, we have safety net programs that are very well functioning uh, between the food stamp program and the Medicaid program. Um, it is not surprising then that people that um, have experienced support from those are even more supportive. But you know, I just wanted to highlight that the majority you know, of respondents uh, had a favorable um, you know, view of this. Um, a problem here, and that sort of correlates with this issue of um, economic crisis, is there are a lot of families who are just out of reach of these programs that does not suggest that then we have to expand the programs, but we do have to think about the people who are out of reach of social programs like food stamps, um, but are still experiencing economic crises. Um, the final thing was, I think one of the su most surprising statistics that I read in this was they asked people whether marriage makes families and children better off across a variety of dim dimensions, but one of them is financially. And I think that there is just undisputable evidence that yes, Marriage makes children and families better off financially, but only 23% of Americans agree with that statement, and uh, that is that is a surprise to me. Um, that is you know, easily refuted by real social science, but I don't know why people don't understand that. So I think that's where I'll leave it. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, uh, and thank you to all the speakers for um, presenting your um, thoughts so crisply. So um, I just wanted to amplify a couple of points uh, and then perhaps push on a couple of the questions that have come up. Um, the first point I want to make, uh, as the David Autor paper has been mentioned, um, and uh, Diane was good enough not to say this, but uh, actually it was a multi-authored paper by a number of Northwestern uh, economists. Um, the, the, the real advantage that David Autor seems to develop is to have a surname that begins with an A and to work in a profession where the standard is to go in alphabetical order. Um, so Diane's sacrifice in taking the name Schatzenbach uh, should be seen even greater. She should have married someone called Aaron or Aardvark. Uh, I wanted to amplify Brad's point about, the, and I think we all agree, the different, the, the, the one of the most interesting areas of research is the differential impact on boys and girls. Um, of lots of economic and social trends. You've already mentioned some of the work by Chetty, but at uh, an event here earlier this year, we delved a bit further into this, and you can see the same um, from the impact of place. So, for example, a boy who grows up um, in Baltimore City, uh, controlling for everything else you can conceivably think of, earns 26% less as a result of growing up in Baltimore City, but there's almost no effect on girls. And so you see, again, that there's this kind of really interesting differential around boys and girls, and in um, psychology, people used to talk about dandelions and orchids. I don't know if that's kind of known to everyone here, but the idea that dandelions pretty much survive whatever you do and orchids need to be carefully looked after. Well, it looks from the evidence as if it's the boys who are the orchids in many cases. And I think that has potentially quite big implications for policy. So I just wanted to push on a couple of things to the, to the panel um, and maybe kind of pick up from I think, one of um, Diane's points, uh, although it's been reflected by all of you, which is to put this very crudely, when we think about family instability, we think about the change in American family life, some, some will emphasize shifts in moral factors uh, and different views about the morality of children outside marriage or children before marriage and so on, or of divorce, and others will emphasize the material factors that lie behind it, which are a sense that I'm not financially secure enough or it's difficult to have a stable family life if you're in an insecure job and so on. So to, to simplify, just for the purposes of the conversation, to the extent that we explain what's happening to the American family largely through changes uh, in moral codes, 
uh, or through material circumstances. I'd just like to invite the panel to kind of comment on that. Uh, and maybe it makes sense to start with Jeremy and or kind of Chris, just in terms of looking at the kind of two surveys. It was striking that economic factors are so strong. What's your interpretation of the survey or just generally of the literature in terms of those, the weight of those two factors? And you press this button. Yeah. Um, I think the most important problem in America is that people don't discipline their children as much as they should. <laughs> just <laughs> harking back to that, Richard. But um, I'll just say one quick thing about that. I don't understand why it can't be all of the above. Um, and I think that that is reflected in the data. It is true that self-identified liberals tend to focus more on economics and self-identified conservatives tend to focus more on, as you put it, morals. Yeah. Um, but it's just as a point of reality, there's no reason it can't be all of the above. And I think, it, I think those realities do exist out there for lots of different people, and the survey proves that. Okay. Brad? I would, yeah, I would also echo that idea that it's, it's both and, but I think it's important to further extend that idea by bringing up a, um, a point that William Julius Wilson made you know, a number of years ago in one of his writings, and that is that I think from his perspective and also from mine, kind of the cultural shifts of the 60s and 70s made our commitment to sort of stable marriage for the sake of our kids much more fragile and contingent. And in a context where that commitment is much more fragile and contingent, economic factors become more salient, you know, for, for couples and for families. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned before, and I think Bill Sahel has mentioned this idea as well, you know, there was no increase in family instability to speak of, you know, in single parenthood, you know, whatnot, in the Great Depression. Tremendous economic dislocation, tremendous suffering, poverty, et cetera. But there was a norm, there was an ethic, there were civic institutions which supported, for better and for worse, you know, stable marriage. Yeah. Those institutions, those norms become much weaker. And so it's for that reason that these sort of economic factors help in part to explain the growing family divide that we see in American life. Do you want to add anything else? No, okay. Um, uh, I was going to ask this question even before I noticed that Belle Sawhill was in the room, uh, I promise, but it's about unintended pregnancy. Um, one of the things that strikes me when I look at some of your results, uh, in particular I was looking at the question on how parents rated each other uh, as parents, um, which probably made all of us grateful that we didn't have to do this survey with our own partner. <laughs> um, uh, and you pointed to the, to the differences between cohabiting and married parents in terms of the way that they evaluated their co-parent. But I wonder whether there's something else going on there, which is that the parents who are cohabiting are more likely to have had the child as a result of an unintended pregnancy than those who are married. I think very often what's actually happening there is that you're seeing the categorization of married and cohabiting expressing a difference in the way that the child came into the world, which is either kind of deliberately or, or unintendedly. And in fact, Bob Putnam's work is, shows very strongly that what happens very often is that kids kind of come along semi-accidentally part. It's very is a, a degree of ambiguity, right? So even if they, even if the child wasn't totally unplanned, they certainly weren't totally planned. There's there's, there's a gray gray area here. So I wonder if that's what I wonder if you're just picking that up, which is I didn't pick this person to be the co-parent anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's the case, then you're almost inevitably going to rate them differently as if I deliberately chose to have a child with this person. So in that sense, there's nothing to do with the fact of cohabitation or marriage in itself. And instead, you just all you're doing is expressing what we can't get at directly, which is, did you mean to have this child with this person? Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I, I certainly think that could be part of it, and it strikes me we could try to get at some of this next time around um, in, in ways that might, might address this uh, more directly. W one of the other things that uh, we didn't talk about today but I think is fascinating is that when we sort of drill down on these cohabiting parents and why they're feeling less support for, or who's feeling less support from their partners, it's the people who are cohabiting parents, uh, cohabiting with uh, a partner, and who are cohabiting, uh, who are parenting children from multiple relationships. Uh, and that's more common in cohabiting relationships than in married relationships. And yeah. it's those parents who are feeling the least amount of support from from their partners. And right, so I think that's so they may not be the parent of the child that exactly. you're judging them against. So exactly. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Diana, Brad, did you want to comment on that? If not, I'll move on to one more question that, um, that I'll, and then we'll, we'll throw this open, um, which is the policy question around family leave. 
these are very, very difficult questions to get at. Uh, and I think you, you've been honest about that in the way you've presented it. Uh, and you show very strong support for family leave. You show much higher support, as you'd expect, from liberals than from self-described conservatives, <laughs> especially when it comes to issue whether they're paid. This is obviously quite a live policy issue and could become one as we go into the, the, the next year, given that there's support for family leave across the aisle, although in different forms. My slight concern about this is that the nature of these questions might tend towards a more positive answer, partly because people aren't really getting any of the cost. So if you say, if you say, would it be a good idea for us to have some time off with our kids, and by the way, wouldn't it be great if that were paid? I'm, I'm caricaturing the question, but <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and then if you say, oh, but by the way, you're gonna have to pay an extra X hundred dollars a year in uh, a social insurance tax or something else, but would you get a different answer? So to some extent, I, I guess I'm kind of asking, what, how do you interpret your own results around that? Does, is it, is it, because on the face of it, you'd be like, everybody in Congress should immediately rush to support a bipartisan bill to, to do this. And I'm just not quite sure whether the support is as deep as you imply. I'm not, uh, yeah, I think there's, uh, I think there's broad support for the general idea, as you describe, Richard, and 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 for fairly generous uh, maternity leaves, especially, right? The average is over three months. Um, and three months paid, right? Pa paid. paid yeah. yeah. So 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 there's a lot of support for that. There's more support among people who have access to family leave currently than those who don't. So it seems, again, that experience matters. But then when we tried to, de to drill down, um, and, you know, there are a number of follow-up questions. There, the, the don't knows just explode. So, so I do think that there's a sense that, um, yeah, this would be a nice thing, but people have not thought deeply about it. They've not thought about who exactly should pay for this? How should it be mm -hmm. paid for? There, I think we just see a much greater level of uncertainty. Okay, thank you. Jeremy, did you want to add something, I Jeremy? Add, I was just going to add one quick thing. Chris already made the don't know point that I was going to make, but I would amplify one thing that where people do not want the government to get involved, intriguingly, is the states. People, for whatever reason, in our political discourse don't think the states really have any role. The, for them, the question is, should it be paid for by a large employer or a small business or the federal government? Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of interesting because in a lot of ways, people you know, that, do is, want is that states. In the survey? Is that, is that is in the survey, even though we didn't highlight it. So you uh, asked the level at which it will be supported. We did ask the level, yes. and states didn't come up as being no, important. It was just the federal government. And no, right. just on a personal note, I'm not sure why we should necessarily limit ourselves in that way. So. Right, OK. Good. Uh, Brad. And on the issue, I think, of, of paid leave, one thing we need to think about as we move forward on this issue is, you know, if we're going to push this policy, which I think has merits, how do we make sure it, it, it's not one more policy that, that ends up benefiting the elites? And you've been writing about this a lot, Richard. But if we look at the data from California, it looks like the take-up is overwhelmingly concentrated among, in a sense, the people who least need, you know, access to, uh, to the policy. So yeah. again, we have to think about, you know, the, the intention here with so much of what happens in D.C. is noble. But in practice, does it end up benefiting the families that you know kind of need the most help in navigating, you know, um, work and family uh, challenges and economic challenges? So why do, why do you think that is, and how could you design the policy to avoid that if you, if you have? Any I'll be thinking about that in the next month. So yeah. Okay. Back to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Diane, anything on that? Or uh, anything more you know, just I we've really changed, right? Uh, Twenty years ago, when President Clinton signed the Family Medical Leave Act, which was unpaid. People thought that the world was gonna to come to an end, and then to have both sides of the aisle this time saying we think that there should be some sort of paid family leave, uh, I think is just a huge <coughs> shift. You know, it, we are very far behind every other nation in the world, on, almost every other nation in the world on this, and so it's, it's, I do think that it's not surprising to see that there's great agreement on this. One thing I wanted to bring up, uh, there are a few other things I wanted to bring up, oh, but this is the one that I'll, I'll, I'll start oh. with. Is, uh, you know, Richard made much of the, uh, in, in his blog post yesterday, about the difference between uh, people who say, I want to get married because, or, do you want to describe it? The oh. commitment, the commitment is Let's more important. Okay, <laughs> the, the, the commitment is more important, or the the marriage, the institution of marriage is more important. And I've been puzzled. I would like to see that cut by whether someone else, if someone reports that they're married. I'm not sure that I know what that means, and I'm not sure how I would have answered it myself. I think we're in a cultural moment where um, a lot of uh, uh, very highly visible people who are married um, have been treating their marital vows uh, very poorly, right. um, to say the least, and. 
you know, under those circumstances, you know, I know that this came, you know, the survey came before that, but under those circumstances, I might be tempted to say, uh, you know, the marriage that's a piece of paper that you cannot, uh, you, you don't necessarily have to respect is less important to me than, than your personal commitment to me. I want to have both, but when forced to say which one is more important, I would like to be, you know, treated with fidelity. Right. Okay. So I don't. I yeah. just. I just don't know what those well, mean. I think it'd be very helpful to get um, brief comments from the panel on this, but um, I will. I'll sort of use my position and respond as you've kindly mentioned that the blog, because I think it was probably clear that I was still figuring out what I thought too. Um, my position uh, is that in the U.S. anyway, marriage is different to Europe, where I come from. Although I am as, as of this week yep, a U.S. Sure. citizen, um, uh, and and I think your chart. Uh, from Putnam and more generally the fact that college educated Americans are married, getting married, staying married, trying not to get divorced, etc. Uh, and that doesn't matter whether it doesn't matter how liberal or conservative they are. You know, it's right. um, as, as someone who comes to the US, it's got extraordinary that, you know, your most liberal colleagues or neighbors wouldn't uh, wouldn't occur to them not to be married. It's literally not even a kind of but question. Then how do they answer that question? Um, so I think the, the liberals will answer as they did in the survey, they'll answer, oh the commitment what is what matters. Uh, the conservatives are more likely to kind of emphasize the institution, although I was struck by the fact that six in 10 under 30s who are conservatives also said it's more important. Actually, I think the more you think about the question, it's actually quite hard to say that the institution is more important than the commitment. Um, I think, you know, nobody would say, let's say you've got a, co a cohabiting committed couple. There aren't that many who stay together through their life, but for what it's worth, if you have natural parents who are committed to their kids and stay together throughout the child's life, those kids' outcomes are very similar to those of married kids because they basically look like a married couple, right? The problem is most cohabiting couples, although I don't know if my data's up to date on this, break up before the kid turns five. So it's the instability that's associated with the cohabitation. So my, my position is that, at least in the US, marriage serves as a commitment device. It doesn't substitute for the commitment and it doesn't merely express the commitment. It is a way that couples who are committed to raising their kids together make that social contract. Uh, and here I think kind of Pollock and Lundberg's work has been very influential on me where they kind of show, I think for a lot of Americans, and I think that's particularly true for highly educated uh, and high income Americans. I think that to understand what's happening to a marriage in America, we have to understand that the most powerful women, economically at least, in the history of the world, with the possible exception of Amazonia a long time ago, uh, i.e. college educated American women are the most likely to get and stay married, right? That is very, not, not what you might have expected in the 1970s, right? I mean, I, I don't know if that's true, but, the, yeah. but it's like, the, so you, you said Americans love marriage, but boy, do college-educated, liberal, uh, highly educated, they love, love, love marriage. <laughs> uh, and so I think we kind of need to understand. So that's where, I, that's where I think we end up, which is it's neither, you know, just an expression, nor the thing. That it, would you rather have someone that was married, would you rather have a mother that was married four times during your childhood, as, as I think J.D. Vance's mother was? Or would you rather have a cohabiting couple that stayed together or even a single parent that stayed with you and didn't have this kind of revolving door of partnership through? I think we all know the answer to that question. So we all know at some level that it's not just the institution. The question is, does the institution help support the commitment? If it's the commitment we want, does the marriage help? So anybody, any uh, responses? Yeah. I have one that I will resist the urge to uh, spend a lot of time talking about how to measure ideology, which I, is something I do when I'm not doing stuff like this. But I will say that um, the single question measure that we use is great, but it does have the following limitation in that um, when we've talked about liberals and conservatives, it's important to keep in mind there are a lot of people in the United States who say they're a conservative, and they say it for lifestyle reasons. They say it for the fact that they go to church, the fact that they live what they perceive to be a conservative lifestyle. Like you're saying, lots of liberals sometimes live that conservative lifestyle, but those conservatives also tend to be, many of them, policy liberals. Not all conservatives are like that. But a big chunk of conservatives are actually secretly in favor, uh, not secretly, if you ask them, they'll, they'll be happy to tell you, in favor of a fair amount of government influence and, and programs like this. And you see this in the survey. Those tend to be their conservatives that are like, yeah, we need more family leave. We need a stronger Medicaid. We need that sort of thing. And I think that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about the ideology. We tend to think that people will divide on policy lines and that they'll be consistent with what we think will be the policy, but right. that's not how it turns out. Okay, I'm going to open this up. Um, questions from the audience, but also uh, I think if people can tweet at me or uh, there's, some, there's some way in which questions appear on this phone, maybe. from, from So if you're watching, uh, tweet at me or tweet at Brookings CCF and we'll see if the magic happens. But in the meantime, we'll take a question from the audience. Yeah, gentleman there. <coughs> yes, uh, 
Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I myself am a child psychiatrist. Can and you say your name for us, please? Bruce Pfeffer. Thank you. And uh, I found that your uh, discussion was very enlightening from a policy point of view. It also does reflect, in many ways, the literature that's in uh, the child psychiatry literature. Uh, however, I was wondering a number of things. One is, in your studies, whether you have investigated the dynamics that are entailed in terms of values, identifications within families, and how much in depth one actually did go into understanding the dynamics that go on with families, the morals that are taught, uh, and the values that are taught. Uh, the uh, studies about the vulnerabilities of boys is mirrored very much in the child psychiatry literature that uh, most people have thought that girls are much more vulnerable. Uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been much literature in terms of how males, mm -hmm. young boys, are much more psychologically more vulnerable. The other question I... Uh, Sorry, just to clarify that question, are you linking those two things together? Are you asking whether the values and moral codes that are taught have a diff different impact for boys than girls in families? No, I'm uh, not linking them together. Okay. I'm just making a comment that okay. there okay. Is, it goes along with the uh, okay. child psychiatry literature. Uh, the other issue is we talk about the value of uh, better economics and how that does help. Uh, there is another side to that coin, is we live in a very driven society uh, where there is a drive for economic success on parts of uh, two parents in a marriage. Mm -hmm. And I've often found myself discussing with parents, uh, how does one raise a child in an affluent environment with middle class values, meaning that how do they uh, how does a child learn that they have a fire in their own belly to do something with their lives? And I'm wondering what your comments would be on this. So you're worried about affluent kids being spoiled, effectively, or not learning? Yeah. I would not use the word spoiled, no, I, but I, don't I, have drive. No, I have kids, though, so I... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have kids in an affluent household. They're very definitely spoiled. <laughs> Okay, let's take a couple more if there are there. Um, Belle Sawhill. Um, could you say who you are, Belle? Uh, I'm uh, Belle Sawhill. I'm here at uh, Brookings. And I want to go back to uh, what Diane said about the fact that it's very puzzling to many economists uh, and to just our common sense that if economics uh, is what lies behind this, and sharing and pooling resources is one of the most efficient and effective mm -hmm. ways to improve your household income and the well-being of your children. Why is it if people are economically threatened or not doing well, yeah. uh, they don't marry? And I think it probably has something to do with something else she said, which is uh, gender roles. And she mentioned the uh, Bertrand and Pan mm -hmm. uh, research here. And when I look at the research that you all referenced um, from Otter or Ardback and et al. <laughs> uh, a great comment, Richard, about uh, changing your name yes. to begin with yeah, A. Are, yeah. um, but I think that what's going on there is something that's similar to what we're seeing with the Donald Trump phenomenon. Uh, or his supporters. I'm going to be provocative now. Why not? Go on, why not? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, we have all this conversation now about, you know, white working class males uh, feeling left behind both economically and culturally, I think. Their status is being threatened, including by women and immigrants and minorities. And I think that something similar is going on here with respect to the retreat from marriage, at least potentially. So just thought I'd mm. raise that okay. and see if you all want to comment. And we're off. Thank you, Belle. <laughs> <laughs> let's actually start there. I know there's a comment at the back, but um, let's, let's go in reverse order, start with Belle, and then move to kind of Bruce. Um, let me amplify it, because I was going to pick this point up as well, which is the extent to which, so people are being economically irrational 
when it comes to decisions about family formation and marriage. It turns out that people are not rationally maximizing their own utility. They, don't have, they haven't read all our papers on income pooling. Actually, I haven't read any papers. Haven't read any papers. <laughs> uh, they, 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 what's wrong with them, right? Uh, and so they have a view about marriage, and maybe the view about the roles within marriage of men and women, and a view about what position you need to be in in order to get, get married that has very little to do with those sorts of rational economic kind of calculations, which is a cultural problem. Um, and then, and many of us have been around this kind of discussion before, the question then becomes, are we going to try and get, back, get our society and economy back to a position where that old model of marriage works, male breadwinner earning more than the woman so that everyone feels more comfortable, et cetera, and, you know, secure job, et cetera? Um, or do we have to accept the fact that the world has changed and renovate our view of marriage and our view of gender roles within marriage? And it seems to me that we're at, we're, we're at a really interesting point in terms of that sort of discussion now because it feels as if uh, the survey reveals to me a, 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 a gap, a gap between the world as it is and a gap between the world as people would need it to be for their model of marriage to work. Uh, and I don't quite, and, and you can close that gap in one of two ways. Um, but I'd, I'd love to know what the, the panel think of that. We'll come back to Bruce's point, don't worry, but just on this specific point that Bell's raised about kind of what's, what's going on there around economic rationality. That's everyone. Diane, why don't you go first as she invoked you? I, as an economist, I, I would be very cautious about ever agreeing with what Richard just said about um, people being irrational. Uh, you know, so I think we just, we don't know we don't know why they're not doing it. But uh, you know, I, I think some things that you can point to in at least in the literature or in, in lived experiences. Um, uh, you know, I guess um, Kathy Eden has this really interesting uh, finding. Maybe Bell was the one that told me about it in the first place. Uh, that. Uh, women are very rationally deciding to have children out of wedlock. And they say, oh, I'll have a baby with that guy, but I would never marry him uh, because what he brings to the relationship is not, uh, is not acceptable. And that's probably some combination of financial and um, you know, social. Uh, so I think I, people are making rational decisions. It is still a puzzle to me why sort of our notion of marriage hasn't evolved uh, more quickly. But to be sure, these trends are going to continue. These economic trends are going to continue. And so you know, to understand what's going to happen to the family in the next 30 years, I guess we need to understand, you know, are, you know, are we going to be able to change you know, the American view of marriage or, or what's going to happen? Yeah. Would, you, would you agree that Kathy Eden's work is primarily with very, typically very, very poor right. communities? Right. And so I always feel the need to say this, that we, we shouldn't extrapolate from that as far up the income scale as some of these marital questions and family stability questions seem to go. So I, I agree with, with that, although you know, I think that it um, potentially is going further up the income distribution you know, today than, than we used to, used to think. Now, I mm -hmm. absolutely agree yeah. Yeah. that elite, highly educated women, um, to which I identify, right, um, are, uh, are not making these same choices. Yeah. You know, things, are, things are different, different there. All right, fantastic. Okay, Brad. Yeah, I think, you know, t on the sort of uh, the point that Bell was, was mentioning about kind of the shifting economic landscape and marriages, I mean, one of the things that we're seeing too in my own research is just that infidelity is reported at higher levels among less educated Americans than it is among college educated Americans today. And I think part of that might be an expression of a kind of economic insecurity, a role in security, and sort of, you know, infidelity is sort of one outlet, you know, for, um, for men who feel, you know, like their status is being threatened. So is it higher among women as well or just men? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I'd have to look into that. Um, but the second piece, in terms of um, the masculinity piece, uh, Richard, that you've been talking about, is I, I, I would agree with you that we need to think about detaching marriage from a kind of a traditional 50s model. Um, but having said that, I don't think that an androgynous um, kind of ethic or ethos is going to be attractive to a lot of ordinary men. So the question then becomes, is there a way to connect contemporary masculinity to marriage and family life in a way that is, um, you know, consistent with our new economic climate? So, for example, I think one thing that I see a lot in my own social context is that there are a lot of guys who are coaching. Um, they're coaching boys and girls soccer, you know, boys baseball, girls softball, et cetera. And so mm. they're they're performing a kind of, I would argue, a kind of masculine role as coaches that I think should be acknowledged and, in a sense, you know, lifted up. And more generally, I think, sort of figure out ways in which men can kind of see themselves as, as playing an important role in their families and communities that's not just predicated upon mm. um, breadwinning. 
Hmm. More of an owl kid's going to model. Um, and, and can I, I, oh, can no, I no, jump let in? Me, oh, really quick, yeah. just because uh, I'll give it to you. Um, uh, figure eight really uh, yeah, speaks this is to where this. Going. Okay, uh, uh, I want to make maybe two points on it. One is that the, it's a, a large share of uh, both men and women report that both men and women contribute to uh, activities around yeah. the house, like cleaning up, like shuttling the kids to different places. Now, when I first read this, I, I chuckled because um, men think that both both contribute to this more than women think that the, both yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they're still uh, they're they're high high levels levels on both yeah yeah, okay, yeah so this is what I wanted to talk about so yeah I think it is interesting that significant percentages are saying that they're sharing in terms of gender roles that they're sharing household activities um, doing the chores paying the bills all those sorts of things women are more likely than men to say that they do it on their own and don't share that. And then when it comes to the, to the response that we share it, men are more likely to say that they share than, than, than our women. So it, that strikes me as evidence that there's still a lot of tradi very traditional sort of gender role um, you know, division of labor going on within families. And men are doing some. They think they are doing more than their wives think they are doing, or their partners think. But they're knowing, doing. Cleaning, right? looking at this, you know, across yeah. the generation gap, across um, education, would all be very interesting. I wonder if, uh, you know, if that's masking, you know, some of the older guys who, you know, never learned how to empty the dishwasher. Yeah. We did look at that, and in in terms of um, people who say they do it themselves, there's no change across generations, and this was surprising right. to me in the number in the percentage of women who say they do it, they do everything everything themselves. So. Interesting. Okay, I, let's move I, on. Oh, I can't prove this from the survey, but I think men have lower standards for what they think <laughs> the contribution <laughs> counts. Okay, okay. That's right. What cleaning catch the pieces? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, I consistently <laughs> fall short, I can tell you. Exactly. All right, it's good. It's Go on in. It's fun. Go but on. in defense of men, too, it's important to acknowledge that when you look at the Pew data and you, and you, and you sum up men. for the average married couple, with kids, the amount of total hours they devote to paid work and unpaid work, it's the same. You know? That's so right. It, there is, That's right. We have to remember that, you know, that there are obviously, we all know there are exceptions to that sort of average, but for the average couple, we're actually looking at equity in terms of total hours. I think yeah. that's right. And even if they do slightly different things, there's a kind of sense of both things. Where the difference emerges, actually, is kind of among younger, uh, so younger men who are very, uh, maybe less attached to the labor market, their leisure hours have gone up. And there's recent evidence that um, they're spending quite a bit of that time playing video games. Um, which is not a moral comment. Video games are awesome. Um, let's just <laughs> let's, anyone go to Bruce's uh, point uh, on the extent to which um, kind of moral values are kind of transmitted, and then relatedly the issues for kind of kids who are raised in more affluent households and kind of l learning. Uh, the skills that will be required for them um, to move forward. Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I'll just comment briefly on we didn't we didn't push on this particular issue all that hard. Although we did ask one question about whether or not it's important for parents to uh, teach their children uh, their political values, and conservatives are uh, agree with that more than liberals do. So political values, not their moral political values. values yes. Okay, great. Uh, Diane, do you want to point on that? Uh, yeah, just, um, I think... Uh, Several questions asked about um, social connectedness, and I was surprised at uh, uh, you know, how little uh, families report that they sort of rely on their neighborhoods to you know continue you know uh, you know to, to basically help teach sort of moral moral things. Um, another uh, two more pieces that, that I gleaned from the survey. Um, one was. Um, you know, in economics, we talk a lot about revealed preferences. So, you know, my explanation for um, that everybody behaves the same in family life is because you, know, you may say one thing, but you know, the, the proof's in the pudding of how you act. Well, something that came up um, mm -hmm. in some of the questions around worship was a large fraction of people say religion is very important to them, and a smaller um, share say that they ever go to houses of worship. Uh, which I think is, is puzzling, is sort of also a way to think about you know, how we're transmitting um, you know, moral qualities to the next generation. If it doesn't involve actually taking them to worship, I think that that's, um, that's very puzzling. Um, the third thing I'll, I'll point out is that um, in figure six, uh, looking at this made, made me laugh out loud when I saw it, um, they asked the question, um, is raising children one of life's greatest joys? And they break it up by whether they have 
whether the person has children or not. Yeah. But what you can very clearly see in the data is people who are most likely to have teenagers are the ones that are saying, yeah. um, maybe not. That's right. um, That's you know, so I, I think that... Uh, this is, you where, know, this so is where I am. Exactly, exactly. So I'm still in the, the sort of middle, yeah. middle place. So you know, I, I wonder, I think that there's a couple of things. One is sort of the lack of community cohesiveness. And the, the second is just, um, you know, I imagine that many of the people that you're talking to are struggling with raising teenagers. And th I think there's a life course piece to this as well. Yeah, it looks as if the people who think, who, are, who most strongly feel that uh, raising children is one of life's greatest joys either don't have kids yet or the kids have left home. Uh, so it's the it's the it's the under thirties and the over and the, uh, those sixty and over. So. So hopefully it's a temporary. Death. So it's going to get better, Diane. We're we're going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes go on. Uh, one point. One thing you may want to look at, and I think there are copies of the report outside or online uh, as well. Table twelve is not exactly what you're looking for, but it gets to what sort of boundaries people place on their kids, and I think that's a reflection of values. It's not a direct measure of values. And what we found there is that, you know, there's some things where lots of people do it and there's some things where very few, for instance, not as many people have required reading time or required music practice. And about two thirds say they have a bedtime. Um, it gets at some of those differences and it doesn't vary by how you label yourself ideologically. Yeah. All right. Does it vary by social class? Does it vary by uh, education or income or class? It varies a little bit. I'm trying to remember exactly what I looked at now. It does not very much by uh, ethnicity or race, All right. and I don't have the education number off the top of my head. Right. I think I looked at it, but I've forgotten it, which probably means it doesn't vary. Yeah, so the basic story is that we're kind of basically the same. When it, once you get inside the door of the family, you're basically doing That's similar right. things. Right? That's right. Okay. Um, there's a lady there at the back. My name is Joe Freeman. I'm a political scientist. I have not read all of your family literature, but I want to ask a two-part question. First part's based on what literature I know, and the second part's based on personal experience. Part one, back when I was in graduate school, uh, many long years ago, I read Jesse Bernard's book on uh, marriage and the family. And she made a point of saying, I can see Bill nodding her head. You know exactly what I'm going to say. Uh -huh. uh, she made a point of saying that there were, in fact, two marriages in every marriage his marriage and her marriage. And they were very different. Huh. I didn't get to pick that up from any of what you said. Uh, basically, she said that uh, marriage benefited men more than it benefited mm -hmm. women. Yeah. And that the main benefit to women was the economic uh, factor that men brought. But the main benefit to men was the fact that women took care of them, attended to their psychological and social and personal needs. Now, now that more and more women are going into the labor force and that economic contribution of men is no longer as important as it was, how has this affected the two marriages, his marriage and her marriage? That's yeah. sort of part one. My, my more personal question is, has to do with single parenting. Again, I haven't read the literature. I'm a political scientist. But I am the child of a single mother and the niece of four other single mothers and the friend of many single mothers. So I've had a fair amount of field observation over the years. And what I have learned from that is that being the daughter of a single mother is good for girls. And it's good for girls because fathers tend to overprotect their daughters. Mothers don't, I can't speak for the sons. And growing up not overprotected makes you much more capable of taking care of yourself, earning your own living, getting your own education, and generally taking care of yourself, which girls who are overprotected don't get. When I looked at the data that you gave us, you didn't distinguish between those single parents who are women and those single parents who are men. I realize they're mostly women, but I, the question is, can you distinguish it? And nor did you distinguish between the sons of single fathers versus the daughters of single mothers. And I think that those separating out by sex would come up with some very interesting results that would not be at all consistent. I also think that what I just said about overprotection may explain why uh, the daughters of single parents, which you did show data on, seem to do much better than the sons mm -hmm. of single parents. Okay, thank you. Because they're not overprotected. Thank you for those two questions. So I'm going to start with Brad and just go, go along. Um, if you just prefer to choose one of those two, um, rather than uh, both, that's fine. Well, I'm sure we'll cover them all between us. But Brad, why don't you kick off on either of those questions, the two, you know, two marriages and the incentives for women to marry changing because of the economic shifts and the kind of differential effect of single parents of different gender. 
Yeah, I think it's definitely right. I think Jesse uh, Bernard's comments about the two marriages is, is still true, although the sort of qualitative story is very different today than it would have been back when she was writing about marriage in the 70s. But on the, on the other point you made in terms of the outcomes, as my comments today suggest, I think that we are seeing that boys are affected more by single parenthood when it comes to things like delinquency, incarceration, education, and employment, as Raj Chetty's recent work suggests with his colleagues. Um, I, I don't know what the alphabetical order is for, <laughs> for that, <laughs> for that C. research. Um, with C, you know, but, um, and again, what's interesting about Chetty's, you know, uh, research, and it's consistent with your, with your comment, is that the women who are from single parent homes were doing relatively better um, when it came to their labor force participation. So, you know, that's an interesting outcome for at least that, that study. But at least today's survey, the American Family Survey we're talking about today, suggests that women are more likely to be struggling in their current relationships as adults, and they're also um, more likely to be exposed to some kind of economic crisis if they've come from um, an unstable family background, probably spending you know, a significant share of their lives in a single parent family context. So um, I think on other outcomes, um, you know, the story would be that um, girls tend to be more likely to flourish when they have a, a, a father present. And we, we do know, for instance, that um, teen pregnancy, a uh, core concern of people in this room, is much less common both in households with a, you know, a father present and even more so in a household where the daughter and the, f well, the daughter is reporting a higher quality relationship with her father. So having his love, his attention, his affection, and his sort of oversight, if you will, his protection, if you will, is linked to much lower levels of teen pregnancy in the research. I'll just add as we go, kind of a uh, couple of points. One is that um, in order to think about the changing incentives around marriage and the two marriages, I wasn't aware of that that book. Um, so I'm grateful for the idea of hers and his marriage. Is why you know why are women marrying at all? Is almost now that women don't need to marry for economic reasons, why should they marry? Is almost the more interesting question. Um, and I'll uh, just amplify the fact that it looks as if it's the women who economically, at least, least need to marry, who are choosing to marry. Um, so Brad, Brad wants to have a go, go, go at me for that. Go on. Well, I'm just go saying on. that yes and no. I mean, they're, 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 they're taking a long-term no, yes. well, view of things, you know, and that is that they recognize that their own kids are going to be more likely to flourish. Oh, that's not, but that's not them. That's their kids. Well, so that's a different, well, and, that's and a they're, completely they're, different they're reason. Their home, their neighborhood, sure, sure, sure. their 401k, you know, Fine. it's all going to be affected by... Yeah, no, I'm not saying, know, it's, so not, I'm not saying a, it's not economically the right thing to do, but I'm just saying that the idea that what was mostly in it for her was... I need a man because he's going to bring the wages in and that will help me to survive economically. There are a lot of women who are now pretty powerful in the labor market who will have a better quality of life, but that's where I think that the co-parenting thing comes in. I think that it's as much about saying we want to raise our kids together, we want to pool our income partly for that reason, and we want a stable family environment to do that, so hey, let's get married, rather than, being, rather than being an economic reason. So I think that the it's become more about the social, familial, all the things you just listed, rather than an economic incentive. Um, and I, that's the only way I can square the circle of the fact that it's the women who least, quotes, need marriage uh, who are choosing it. I think it's become a more, I think it's again become more of a social institution than an economic one. Um, Bell wants in badly. God, Bell wants in badly. But I'm gonna, let, let me just skip along the panelists. Is there anything else on this specific point from any of our other two panelists? Or Bell, do you want to dive back in? Go on. Uh, go on. Well, All right, go on, Dan. Who, Oh, sorry. I, I'm just going to say quickly, uh, those are great points, and I'm going to go back and look at that book again, which I have looked at before. But the data, even though I don't, I, don't, I don't have a table to point you to, but we have looked at this enough to know women do like marriage a lot. Um, and if anything, I think they may like it more than men do, uh, but, but they, do, they do like it a lot. I was going to say that, um, you know, I, I buy the uh, uh, Stevenson and um, Wolfer's argument here, which is the reason well-educated women and men are still marrying is because they have renegotiated uh, not just child rearing, but all kinds of other things. And they are supporting each other in many, many ways that go way beyond children. And, they, uh, and there's evidence that well-educated men have changed their gender role expectations far more than less educated men. Right. Less educated men are having difficulty making this transition, psychologically, if you will. 
uh, in terms of norms and gender roles, and well-educated men are having a lot less uh, trouble. So I don't find it uh, so hard to understand. I mean, think of it as uh, the way that um, uh, uh, Hannah Rosen talked about it. It's more of a almost a partnership, like a business partnership mm -hmm. or a roommate situation. I mean, I don't want to say that all the intima intimacy things don't matter, but um, it's not just about children, in my view. That's right. And if there's more power, if if the economic power gets equalised, then that allows women to there are some stronger negotiating yeah. positions, so they set the bar higher. Um, and men have to clear, if men want to be in a successful marriage, they have to clear that bar. So we're running up on time, but I have one, one more question, and then, uh, and then we'll have to close. But Brad, go on, kick in. I, I'm just not so sure about, about gender roles. I just think if you, if you think carefully about Kathy Eden Marie Kapalis' book, their, their problems were not about who was doing what around the household. It was about kind of responsibility, reliability, fidelity, commitment. Yeah, well, that's what my theory does, Rick. Well, but I don't think that's a... I think it's a gender role thing per se. I think it's more about you know, is there a, a male responsibility ethic right. that is again not very small out? group of very poor. Yeah, very people. very small <laughs> group. But I would say that you know those women are also raising the bar when they say uh, you know if we're going to live together, if we're going to make a commitment to each other, I want you to be reliable, okay. and I want you to be faithful. We're going to move to the last question, but. Um, uh, if there's anything you want to pick up on the way, but we are, we are right up against time. So this is uh, coming from outside. It unfortunately, looks like it might be one of my kids. They should be at school. <laughs> uh, I, guess, uh, I guess there's a reason why. Okay, fine. Um, which is, given, given the current trends, uh, uh, given the survey evidence and the current trend, I'm paraphrasing it, um, do we think that 20 years from now, uh, um, there will be more marriage in America or less, given current trends? And what we know, do we think there'll be more marriage or less? I don't know how we define that as kind of, you know, we could get into a wonky argument, but do we think that marriage is on the up or on the down over the next kind of 20 years? Uh, and let's go this way again so that we kind of finish with our main presenters. Go on, Brad, up or down? Uh, definitely down. <laughs> there'll, be few, there'll be less marriage over the next kind of 20 years. I agree with that. We were just at a conference um, marking 20 years since welfare reform, and there were four components to welfare reform. It was a decrease in teenage pregnancy, increase in self-sufficiency. I forget what the third one was, but then the fourth was increasing marriage. And basically, victory was declared on the first three. They said, we really failed. Like, marriage has gone down. I think it's going to continue to go down unless there's some sort of a inter social intervention, but I don't know who would be doing that. Well, I think, I think there's a lot of optimism about marriage, um, I, I, about one's own marriage relationships, and, uh, but more concern about other people's marriage relationships, right? And I think that's a, that's a really interesting finding, that when people get into marriage, they seem to like it, and yet they're very worried about the health of it overall. Uh, the other thing, I guess I'd just go back to where I started the presentation, which is one of the things that we're seeing is this decoupling of children, first child, inside or outside of marriage. And I, I just don't know what, what the effects of that are going to be long term. I mean, we, we now have a generation in which most people gave birth or became parents for the first time outside of the context of marriage. And I don't know quite how that will affect uh, how we think about marriage in the future. Okay. Just to add to what Chris was saying, this is from last year's report, not this year's report, but one of the really interesting nifty things that I guess maybe I should have known, but I'm also a political scientist and I'm new to some of these things, was that people view marriage as like a capstone kind of thing that you have. Younger people especially feel like I've got to have a good job, I've got to be squared away in all of these different ways. And older generations were more willing to jump in and just let it roll. The more we make marriage into this status that can only be obtained after one has perfected many other things, that's going to contribute to the trend that Chris is talking about. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, presenters uh, and our panelists and Deseret News and BYU for um, bringing out this fascinating survey. Uh, as I think Diane said, there is um, lots, lots more in here. I think there'll be more coming out from many of us on this panel uh, on this survey. Uh, I hope that the survey continues already in the two years it's been going. I think established itself as a really valuable resource for those of us working in this field. So I'd like to thank you for today's for helping us with today's event, but also for the work around the survey. Please join me in uh, thanking the panel and the presenters. Thank you.